May I speak in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God. Amen. You may be seated. A few weeks ago, I facilitated a conversation for the leadership team of our parish school, Ventana. Our head of school, Amanda, asked if I knew of an activity that could surface spoken and unspoken expectations between people. And thankfully, I had just the thing. So one morning, she and I gathered with her seven directors, and I invited them in a fairly structured way to reflect on the following questions. What do they expect of Amanda? What do they think she expects of them? And what do they expect of each other? At the same time, I sent Amanda to her office to reflect on a parallel set of questions. What does she expect of her team? And what does she think they expect of her? When they, we then came together to discuss the lists and debrief. When it came time to read side by side what the directors expect of Amanda and what Amanda thinks they expect of her, we realized that there are a number of things Amanda is responsible for that her team never sees and would not even know to expect. For example, she figured her directors would want her to liaise proactively with Ventana's board of tra trustees and to sure ensure alignment between the school's mission and what happens day to day in our program. But her directors, understandably, almost never see her interact with the board. They don't attend board meetings. They're not always tuned in to the differences between board and operational responsibilities. Likewise, while our directors are certainly aware of and committed to our mission, there's a whole level of attending to it that assuming the head is doing their job, there's no reason for them to see. As we surfaced this tension, that many of the most mission critical elements of the leader's portfolio aren't readily apparent. Amanda joked that essential features of her job would only be visible if she were not doing them. Her directors would know if she dropped the ball on managing the financial life of the school because their budgets would run dry. But when she's managing this well, they can just take it for granted. Likewise, her team would know if she failed to articulate the mission of the school to the admissions team and ensure we were only admitting good fit families because the students and parents in the program would have a wide range of conflicts and concerns if this was not the case. It occurred to me facilitating this exercise that many essential parts of my role are likewise not all that apparent to many members of the church and that probably this is true for most leaders. Important, vital aspects of maintaining the health of an organization or a community aren't always apparent, unless they aren't happening, in which case it's a big problem. I thought of this as I sat with this week's gospel, which reads in many ways like a job description for the good shepherd. Jesus seems to be offering the disciples some version of the same exercise I took Amanda and her team through. Here is who I am, he is saying, and what I'm about. Here is what you can and indeed should expect of me. And here, in turn, is what I expect of you and what you can expect from each other. It makes me wonder how much of what Christ does to care for us we take for granted, barely even noticing, even as it makes every other good thing in our lives possible. So what does the Good Shepherd do? Well, he lays down his life for the sheep. Unlike the hired hand who does not care for the sheep, and will abandon them when the flock faces threat, like the presence of a wolf, the good shepherd stays. The good shepherd defends the flock. The good shepherd protects and provides, because the good shepherd 
cares. The good shepherd also knows the sheep and is known by them in turn, just as the Father knows Jesus and Jesus knows the Father, which is to say, deeply, intimately, entirely. The good shepherd also tends to the size and health of the flock as a whole, going out to find other sheep who will listen to his voice and occasionally leaving the flock to retrieve those lost or left behind. It is because the good shepherd knows and loves the sheep that he wants the flock to be constantly growing and changing and evolving with porous boundaries between who is in and who is out. So the flock is familiar, familial, and also profoundly diverse, full of old friends and newcomers, people like us, and people not at all like us. All it takes to belong is a willingness to listen to the shepherd. This is how Jesus is for us. This is who Jesus is for us. This is Jesus for us, always and forever. Of course, the part that goes unspoken, that makes this metaphor possible at all, is that Jesus is present. Jesus is with us, willingly, in love. In order to be the good shepherd, he made choices again and again to live among us, to dwell with us. So this is our friend and our Lord and our Savior. This is how he is constantly tending and attentive, continuously earning our trust. It's hard to imagine what it would be like if this were not so. A good shepherd who disappeared in the moment of crisis would hardly be good. A good shepherd who wasn't paying attention would, likewise, lose the confidence of the flock over time. Even if you weren't the one getting lost, noticing that no one was paying attention to those who did would make any reasonable sheep a bit anxious. A good shepherd who wasn't consistent and gentle and generous would not be worth listening to. This is how Jesus is with us. And this is how Jesus wants us to be with one another. Five times in this brief passage, we hear that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, freely, willingly, gladly. In today's epistle, we heard this reiterated to the early church. We know love by this that he laid down his life for us, and we ought also to lay down our lives for one another. A few weeks ago, as evening fell on Palm Sunday, I met up with a few parishioners active in Vital and Thriving at Spark Church, an evangelical adjacent community of faith just over the Palo Alto border. During the worship service, we heard a wonderfully compelling sermon from a graduate of Fuller Seminary who told the story of a recent event he attended at his alma mater, wherein the current president interviewed his predecessor, Dr. Richard Mao. The former president of the seminary was in office on September 11, 2001. And on September 12th, he extended an invitation to many Muslim leaders in and around Pasadena to come and make use of their office space in order to ensure these fellow faith leaders were safe. Fuller is a non-denominational evangelical seminary generally thought of as quite conservative. They typically serve Christian leaders and communities who are suspicious of Islam and its followers. So as you can imagine, this invitation to local Muslim leaders was not without some controversy. The current president of the university asked his predecessor if this had been a difficult decision for him to make. And Dr. Mao shook his head, incredulous. 
We as Christians are not called to give office space to our enemies, Dr. Mao said. We are called to die for them. No, it wasn't a difficult decision at all because it was clearly the right one. Now, setting aside the question of whether or not Muslims, by virtue of being Muslims, are our enemies, which clearly as someone married to a Muslim, I do not believe, I still found myself deeply moved by this exchange. While I was still quite young, I remember September 12, 2001. I imagine many of us do. The fear, suspicion, rage, and grief enough to fuel invasions and wars and assassinations for years to come. I don't think Muslims are the enemies of Christians, but it wasn't only fundamentalist evangelicals who felt that way the day after 9-11. And even then, even then, this man saw clearly at least this one thing, that if we are called to be like Jesus, and we are, then we too are called to a risky, costly, sacrificial love. God did not bother taking on flesh, coming among us as one of us, living and dying and rising, so that we might be an ounce happier, a tiny bit more comfortable, a little less bothered by sin and darkness. Jesus went through everything he went through so that our minds and our hearts and our lives would be changed forever, for good, radically transformed, and through us, the entire world. What Jesus calls us to is so much more than lukewarm liking and tepid tolerance. It's a world that isn't ruled by greed and pride and selfishness, where we aren't constantly depleted and anxious and afraid of each other, where we don't have to worry if our cell phones or food chains or clothing choices are harming people downstream because people aren't being harmed downstream for the ease of a few. It is daunting. It is a lot. It is also the only way of life that is truly worthy of our humanity. Sacrificial love is not the same thing as codependent desperation. It isn't the kind of giving that depletes and harms the giver. At the root of the word sacrifice is the word sacred. Sacrificial love is costly, yes, but it is a practice of generous and outpouring love that makes us whole, that draws us closer to the very heart of God, that fills us with joy overflowing, that bringing others into the fold and welcoming with open arms those who have strayed or been left behind. In a recent interview about his best-selling book, Soul Boom, Why We Need a Spiritual Revolution, actor Rain Wilson, who identifies as Baha'i, was asked what a spiritual revolution rooted in compassion would really look like. I should note that this is a very popular and very secular podcast. With a long list of possible examples, historic and imagined, he pointed to the early church as the best example he knows of a compassionate revolution. Those first disciples in those first dizzying days and years after that first Easter. Imagine, Wilson invited listeners, a world where people care for each other just to care for each other. Where exchanges are not transactional but mutually enlivening where we aren't constantly competing and comparing and condemning, but practicing, actually living the values of Jesus. Imagine it. It's such an audacious vision that it can seem far off, ridiculous, even offensive. But this is the dream of the Good Shepherd. This is the way of the Good Shepherd. 
And while it has never been the historic norm for long, it is possible. It has been before, and it could be again. I started by suggesting that we might not be very aware of all the good that the Good Shepherd does, that it's easy to miss and take for granted the love that buoys our days, the grace that sustains us, the hope that is as close as the breath in our lungs and the sun on our face and the bird song in our ears, the beauty that inspires our days. It is especially hard to imagine what it would look like if this good shepherd stopped doing all the work of being a good shepherd when we live in a world that makes it so very difficult to feel God's love and concern. Even in this beloved flock, it still gets cold on the pasture and lonely, and sometimes we are the ones who fall behind, anxious and afraid. So wherever we find ourselves in relation to this good shepherd of ours and the wider fold, may we be encouraged by the reminder of the great faithfulness of God, a God who knows us, who loves us, who cares for us, a God who stays, who willingly lays down God's life for us and goes out of their way to bring us home. And may even a brief moment of clarity about who God is and who we are called to be give us the strength and the courage and the joy to do the same. Amen.